Hello and uh, welcome to the latest presentation in our Rift Valley Network webinar series. My name is Andrew Harvey and uh, because our usual host Anna Coit is enjoying a well-deserved vacation, I'll be the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application. So Matthew Nisley is a PhD candidate in anthropology uh, with an emphasis in archaeology at the University of Chicago. He previously obtained an MA in the social sciences from the University of Chicago and a BA with honors in anthropology from Washington University in St. Louis. His research focuses broadly on human environment relations ranging from the historical archaeology and anthropology of foragers to the Anthropocene. He's also interested in political ecology and landscape studies post-coloniality, temporality, and ethnobotany and, arche and archaeobotany. I know Matthew best through his work with the Sandawe people, which uh, represents the first archaeological investigation of landscape occupation, food getting repertoires, and exchange networks over the last 3,000 years in what is now the Sandawe homeland of north central Tanzania. So with that, I'll ask you to please join me in welcoming Matthew to present his talk titled Disciplinary Deja Vu, Interdisciplinarity and the East African Khoisan with Khoisan in quotations. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. I was very excited. Uh, I've known Andrew for several years now and I was very excited to learn about the Rift Valley Network. Uh, I've been able to participate in uh, one other uh, webinar earlier this summer and hope to stay involved. One of the things that excites me the most about the group um, is uh, in addition to uh, and having an opportunity to get to know other people who are working in the region, uh, I think it uh, shows great potential to encourage uh, um, interdisciplinary work in, in the area and that is very much the topic of, of my presentation today. Um, and given that the, uh, this format can sometimes be difficult for people, I'm going to try to limit the, uh, straight reading that I do. I'll probably limit that to about five or six paragraphs. We'll see. And to the extent that I can, I will, uh, do this a little bit more casually. Part of that decision is because I realized when I sent the abstract, uh, that I, uh, more or less promised two very different talks. So um, I'll try to give an overview of, um, of this intellectual history that I've been working on. Uh, and I'll also try to give a brief overview of the archaeological fieldwork I'm doing. And I'll try to explain how they fit together. If there are um, elements of that that are not clear, feel free to, to ask for, you know, ask some questions uh, after, after I finish and I can try to clarify. So what I thought I would do is give a, a bit of background first in, in why I became interested in doing this kind of an intellectual history and how it led to doing archeology. span So the first work that I did in this area of Tanzania was in 2005, 2006, and it was an ethnobotanical project. And I was uh, doing a project focused specifically on the use of leafy vegetables by the Sandawa, which seems very random, uh, and it kind of is, but uh, um, there have been a lot of studies of leafy vegetable use, and they're often, they oftentimes uh, look at issues of um, how uh, dietary diversity and nutrition is being maintained or not as rural communities of Afri Africa become incorporated uh, uh, more heavily into market based economies. And I thought the Sandawe were a particularly, particularly interesting group to do this kind of a, a study with because of the fact that they've been talked about in the literature as foragers. And there's also been a, a history of scholarship of, of thinking about how foragers transition to food production. So I went into it uh, after I finished my uh, BA really with that kind of, of thinking. Um, I'd been to Tanzania, I'd not been to this part of Tanzania, uh, which is, I'll show another map later, but um, it's in central, the central highlands of Tanzania, near where the orange star is and on that upper left-hand map. 
what I realized over the course of the year, first of all, the Sandawa use a lot of leafy vegetables. They use over 70 different species of leafy vegetables. And one of the things that I started to realize is that the way, the number and range of species that they use, the way they use them, the way they interact with them through space and time across the course of the year, um, really couldn't be explained by thinking about this sort of simple transition from foraging to, to farming. Uh, it was really much more complicated and, and, and showed elements. You could think of it um, through both lenses very usefully. So then I uh, began to wonder, well, how was it that the Sandawe ever came to be categorized as hunter-gatherers to begin with? And um, especially because I did know that uh, at the time of the first ethnographic descriptions of the group in the 1800s, that they were already, um, they were practicing uh, a, a very mixed economy. So even some of these earliest accounts of them talk about um, their uh, foraging practices, but also talk about the fact that they're raising livestock and growing crops. And um, one of the things that struck me uh, while going back and sort of rereading the literature about the Sindawe was that the very first uh, description of the Sandawe in the 1890s was remarkably similar to the description of the, of the Sandawe um, in the 1990s. And so I wondered how is it that really over a century, the, scholar, the ways that scholars talk about the Sandawe, both as a group and their relation to other groups and their, their position within long-term historical narratives of Africa really hasn't changed all of that much. Um, and so for, um, my master's degree, I actually elaborated upon this and actually did the, this intellectual genealogy that I'll be talking about briefly at the beginning of the talk. That then actually got me more interested in the prehistory of the region. So I had always presumed that I knew that I wanted to get a PhD in anthropology. I always presumed that I would do cultural anthropology. But this, um, this exercise brought up several different lines of evidence that indicated to me that uh, the history of this region of Tanzania was perhaps um, more complicated than the sort of traditional uh, uh, understanding of the region. So for the PhD, I decided to do an archaeological project. Um, it's what I would say there are other archaeologists who've worked in the Sandawe homeland, but this is the, this is the first um, uh, regional scale project uh, that's also trying to um, deal with such a large swath of, of time. So that's sort of the general background about how I, um, how I got to do <laughs> archaeology in the first place. Um, and I wanted to, and to also situate where I'm coming from a bit more, uh, this map is certainly familiar to uh, all of you on the group, I'm sure. Uh, one of the reasons that the Sandawe uh, are considered to be an, an interesting group uh, historically is because they are uh, one of two groups uh, in Eastern Africa and Tanzania uh, who speak languages that include click consonants. And further, uh, and most of, of other languages like that are in Southern Africa, uh, further, Tanzania is the only um, location on the continent where you have representatives of all um, language families that appear to have emerged in or near Africa. And this was just another map that I found on Wikipedia that I quite liked. Um, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's really great. It probably took a lot of work. Um, each, you can... On, when you find this map on Wikipedia, you can actually, each of the, of the names links to a description of the language. So, um, uh, and this again also just situates you a little bit more geographically. Uh, as I mentioned, Central Highlands of Tanzania, for those of you that know some of the archeological sites, um, the yellow stars list some of the particularly well-known archeological sites from, from Northern Tanzania. And then here is um, another probably familiar map uh, for those of you that work in, uh, in the rift of the Sandawe homeland. There's no um, strict uh, boundary to what's considered the homeland, uh, but this one often gets used. This is uh, the administrative unit that 
uh, um, most of the Sandawi were living in in the 1960s and 1970s. The administrative unit is more or less um, like this today, but it has changed somewhat. Um, and uh, the, well, I'll, I'll come back to some of the geographical features later. Um, and so not only is Tanzania where you see all these different languages, the Sandawi are very interesting, um, as I mentioned, because they do practice this mixed economy. And um, one of the questions has become uh, over the years about the Sandawi has been um, uh, how they did take on uh, uh, various aspects of food production while also still being a very large group because the, the general story is that across most of Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, at one point in time, everybody, it was all foragers living in a world of foragers, um, but that uh, as food production spread across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, most foraging groups were either exterminated, dispersed, or assimilated in some way. And so the Sandawe seemed to be a sort of outlier community uh, that not only lives on and to descendants of whom live on into the present, but is actually quite, quite large and a fairly robust uh, linguistic community. I like this picture um, because I think it encapsulates uh, some of what I've just described. So uh, these women are actually climbing a young baobab tree to harvest the leaves uh, to make mlenda. And uh, if you look closely at the foreground, you can tell that that tree is actually growing in a, in a um, fallowed sweet potato field. Uh, but the Sandawi do continue to uh, uh, hunt and gather. Uh, this was, there was a, a, a young guy when we were doing some excavations who asked us if we wanted a snack. <laughs> and we said, what do, you, what do you have in mind? And he said, well, this hill over here has a lot of rock hyrax. So, um, uh, I could supply you with the hyrax, and uh, it was a great example in uh, uh, market uh, economics. They started out 2,000 shillings, and by the end of the dig, were 5,000 shillings apiece as the population went down. And this was out doing doing surveys, so certainly most men will continue to carry uh, bows and arrows. Very common sight. Uh, a couple of things to remember before I jump in here, and this might not be as much of an issue as I'm, as I'm talking over things. I would be happy to share some of the written work, but a couple of things that I did just want to keep in mind, put on the table. I know this topic can be very contentious. Um, I want to be generous and generative. Uh, I'm not here uh, to, as the kids say, uh, score any sick burns. Uh, I'm really interested in uh, how to work across disciplines to uh, uh, write new kinds of, of stories. And another thing to keep in mind is that my training is, an is an, as an anthropologist and an archaeologist, so I likely can't answer detailed questions about uh, linguistics. And at this stage, and, and also sort of my approach to thinking about uh, these different kinds of interdisciplinary evidence, is that I'm more interested in identifying habits of thought and conceptual associations than really digging apart specific arguments, although that's important too. Um, that's not what I'm doing here. Um, and as I, as I mentioned in the abstract, the, the literature that I drew on to conduct uh, this, histor this intellectual history uh, of the Hadza and Sandawe draws pretty heavily from uh, what's known as science and technology studies. Science and technology studies historically um, has been used to study things like physical, lab, physics labs, uh, like at CERN uh, in Europe, um, or other or uh, pharmaceutical companies. There has been a tendency uh, among scholars working in this tradition to focus on Western techno science, but there's particular kinds of lessons from that literature that are applicable to other situations. Uh, some of them that I've listed here are that um, categories have histories. Uh, categories are not neutral. The content of categories can change, and so a word can mean something different over different points in time, can point to different kinds of evidence. Um, one, of the, one of the charges that uh, gets raised against science and technology studies is that it's too constructivist and so that it sort of undermines everything. Everything is built on a foundation of sand. Uh, 
Um, but I actually don't think that's fair because uh, I would say that most people working in this tradition recognize that categories are indispensable to thought. Um, however, it's important to keep in mind that they can both facilitate and limit the kinds of um, interpretations that we can make about the world. Um, and so what I'm interested in this case is, um, uh, you know, many people recognize a variety of problems with the Khoisan category and how it's used. And what I'm uh, interested in doing is um, sort of thinking, thinking through the history of that category, thinking through the history of the associations, what gets um, labeled Khoisan, uh, and more importantly, um, how, that how that has allowed us to say certain things, but also how that's prevented us from saying other things. And, um, and in particular, what kinds of evidence or what kinds of instances uh, can sometimes be read away as noise or is just not important. Um, another approach that I'm using here, and I'm still kind of working through it, um, I'm not sure that I'll stick with it, but something I've been, uh, that I have found useful and I've been working with recently is this idea of drawn from, semi, um, from semiotic anthropology called semiotic bundling. And uh, the idea, the basic idea with semiotic bundling is to think about how do signs, so in this case what I'm using is um, various lines of historical evidence like morphemes, uh, genes, artifacts, uh, how do they come to be seen as indexing or pointing to the same thing? Or another way to put it is how, what are the, the sort of conceptual associations or bridges that are necessary for one line of evidence to stand in for another? Um, or another way you could think about it is um, how are the contours or gaps of a story sort of rounded out um, in the absence of a, of a full picture? And so some of the questions that came up as I was doing this kind of history are, what is the context in, in which the Khoisan category arose? Um, what were the steps through which Khoisan came to be applied to Hadza and Sandawe? Um, and on that point, what does it mean? So you'll oftentimes see that, that the Hadza or Sandawe are Khoisan, but in any given instance, it's not it's very rarely entirely clear what that's actually pointing to. Does that mean linguistically? Does that mean genetically? Does that mean culturally? Does it mean something else? Um, and uh, another thing that is that I've been thinking a lot about, uh, you'll notice I'm presenting a lot of questions and not necessarily a lot of answers, but that is sort of towards the end of, of being generative, like I said. Another question that I've been thinking a lot about is, to what extent do the conceptual associations of earlier uses of a term uh, get carried forward when we continue to use them if the content of that category has changed? And so that sounds very abstract and complex, but um, one of the, to, to illustrate that, um, I, I do think that it is impossible to understand uh, fully the conceptual associations of Khoisan without thinking about 19th century evolutionary theory. Every anthropologist, almost, every anthropologist would at least on the surface say, we know that those frameworks have problems. We know those frameworks are wrong for a number of theoretical and empirical reasons. And yet there are certain kinds of as I you know, call them habits of thought or um, conceptual shortcuts that continue to get used in the present by people who on one hand say that those earlier frameworks are wrong, but are also using certain elements of them uh, to interpret evidence today. And so what, I'm, what I've been trying to do is sort of tease apart that and figure out um, it's not to say we should get rid of it all, but trying to think critically about what elements of it are actually useful for us today and why, what elements are not useful for us and why, how do we articulate that um, and be very precise in our use of these terms when we're dealing with different kinds of evidence. And um, why does all of this matter? Always an important question. One of the reasons I think it is so important is because um, Across Africa, 
Sub-Saharan Africa especially. The archaeological record is becoming increasingly diverse. We're always being surprised uh, by what's happening uh, from archaeology. This is even particularly true when comparing Kenya to Tanzania. For all sorts of reasons, Kenya has had a much longer and much um, stronger tradition of archaeological research than Tanzania. And anybody, to be quite honest, anybody who tells you that they really have an understanding of what's going on archaeologically and mainly in Tanzania is lying to you, because we do not. And I'll, I'll talk about some of the evidence that has come up over recent years, but we, the existing models, especially models that have been used more or less well in Kenya, just don't work in Tanzania. And I think, um, and so if people have been grappling with that, um, and there are many who have, um, people have been trying to think of other ways of narrativizing all of this evidence, other models to explain the evidence. And I think what it all points to is that, that we have to keep in mind is that all of these different lines of evidence that are, that are available to us were produced through social processes that operate over different spatial and temporal scales. However, if you go too far down into each one, it, um, and so as I say here, if you're being a splitter, it can prevent you from being able to talk about patterns across lines of evidence, other forms of correlation. So in this case, you're missing the forest for the trees. If you're a lumper and you um, too easily say, well, this is the same, this is sort of a similar historical process as this and, and this, then it risks downplaying the diversity of the archaeological record or other historical record that I think for Tanzania is really starting to display itself. Uh, I certainly think some of the writing that I've come across from the folks in the RVN uh, has, has been showing this as well. I just, I really don't think that we have a good idea um, uh, about what, what was going on in Tanzania more than 500 years ago yet. We might have thought we did, but I, I just don't think we do. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. Like I said, I'd be happy to um, give you some of the some of the written work that I've done about this. Um, one of the, I think one of the traps that we fall into, um, and I think this is one of the things that many of us, uh, oftentimes without realizing we've done it, uh, sort of have inherited from from some of these earlier categories, is um, I think too easily uh, thinking of linguistic or economic categories as uh, temporal categories. So what I was trying to indicate on this slide is for Tanzania, now this framework has, has changed um, over the years, but at this point, uh, when you think about some of the, the linguistic groupings, Khoisan, Cushitic, Bantu, Nilotic, um, in this case, it would actually be forager, pastoralist, farmer, pastoralist, or agro-pastoralist. Um, and there's been tons of writing, some of it very controversial. I'm not going to go into it uh, in too much detail. But the general idea is that Khoisan is older as a, as a cultural form. Um, it's a simpler cultural form. Uh, thinking of the band level society um, that got produced through the really groundbreaking ethnographic work from Southern Africa in the 60s. And that, oh wait, I mixed up my terms. It should have been, no, yeah, older, simple, and younger and more complex at the other end. So, so that these, um, so that these, the entrance of these different language groups into Tanzania sort of represent um, newer groups who are practicing more complex social forms. Um, sure, in the grand scheme of things, we know that everywhere in Sub-Saharan Africa, people were foragers, and then at some point they weren't, or most people weren't. Um, is that too simplistic? Uh, and I would say, certainly from the archaeological record, yes. Uh, it, um, when you're looking at uh, economic specialization, for example, um, Specialized pastoralism, for example, seems to be very rare, especially early on. Um, it, it actually becomes quite difficult to sort of to clearly delineate um, different kinds of groups based off the archaeological evidence of their of their economic practices, because it seems like 
early pastoralists are still doing a lot of foraging. And it also seems like in some situations, foragers were more than happy to start experimenting uh, or exchange um, um, domestic uh, goods with folks who may or may not have migrated in the area. So let me jump into the intellectual history. Like I said, I'll, I'll try to, let me check my time. Yes, I will speed things up. Um, as I mentioned, the, what got me started on this was that um, Bauman's account in the 1890s, which is the first ethnographic, quasi-ethnographic account that we have of the Sindawe, um, I found to be quite striking to Newman's in the 1990s. And so um, as early as the 1890s, uh, Bauman uh, saw links linguistically due to the cliques between the Sindawe language and those of, of Southern Africa. Um, by 1990, Khoisan family becomes the term for that. Uh, in the 1890s, uh, blood mixture uh, was how it uh, was described. Uh, whereas in the 1990s and into the present, there's been a lot of work thinking about the extent to which um, the Sindawe uh, have both ancient and newer uh, genomic lineages. Um, and then also when it comes to hunting and gathering and this idea that they've been somehow, um, that they're autochthonous, but also somehow uh, isolated. And so that becomes the sort of the crux of the historical question that people are trying to answer when they, when they look at this in that way. And that's an interesting question. I also just think there's other questions we can, we can uh, talk about with this in that way. Oh, I'll get to that in a moment. So this is one, one section where I am going to read um, I'll stop sharing just for a moment. So this is from a chapter of my dissertation about, this is sort of a snippet of the section about the linguistics. So I just wanted, and I, what I did in this chapter is I actually go, I go through this in more detail. I, I look at linguistic evidence. I look at um, the history of anthropomorphic and later genetic studies. I look at archaeological studies, uh, and I also look at ethnographic studies to see in each of those situations how, how and when did Khoisan come to be applied to those different lines of evidence in scholarship on the Hadza and Sandawe. So I, um, I try to trace how the term emerged from research in Southern Africa and how scholars created links between that term across all this other kinds of evidence to Eastern Africa. So this is a, just a section from the linguistic section that I'll read. So bear with me. I hope it's not too uh, tedious given the format we're on. So uh, Schulze coined the term Khoisan in his 1928 description of Khoi Khoi and Bushman bodily forms. And also, as far as terminology goes, in this chapter, I often use the terms that the particular scholar used in their own writing. And so just in case that comes up. Um, in which he argued that anthropometrically speaking, the two groups are identical. The term was popularized soon thereafter by Shapira in a 1930 volume in which he suggested that these groups, previously differentiated by subsistence practices, displayed sufficient linguistic and sociocultural similarities to be considered a single entity. Setting aside the suitability of this new all-encompassing term for the diversity of Southern African peoples, it is essential to note that nearly from the moment of its creation, Khoisan referred to a broad range of phenomena of interest to numerous disciplines with differing epistemic systems. Greenberg is responsible for extending, and I'm not going to mention all the citations, uh, Greenberg is responsible for extending the Khoisan category to the East Af Eastern African context. He initially grouped Southern and Eastern languages, including click consonants, under the rather obvious header of the click language family. In his first article on the matter, Greenberg adopted Shapira's term Khoisan for only the Southern African languages. By 1963, however, he stated that, quote, terminologically, it is convenient to extend the usage of Khoisan to include this entire group of related languages. His shift in nomenclature from the click language family to the Khoisan family thereby created slippages between the terms Khoisan, Sandawe, and Hadza. 
That is, it became anal analytically acceptable to say that the Sindawe and Hadza languages are also Khoisan languages. And I also provide examples of scholars doing this in their work. Um, this slippage was amplified by another notable feature of Greenberg's study. Uh, although he uh, um, rather savvily critiqued the use of non-linguistic data and racial frameworks as a primary guide for linguistic analysis, uh, out of the hundreds of languages included in his studies, it's only during his discussion of the Khoisan family that he explicitly mentions subsistence practices. So this referential indeterminacy of Khoisan continued to balloon as scholars and other disciplines quickly adopted the term as an umbrella for non-linguistic features of Hadza and Sindawe, following Schultze and Shapira's earlier precedent in Southern Africa. And so this comes from uh, Imogene Lim, who's a good friend of mine. Uh, she had done a study of rock art in the Sindawe homeland in the 80s. And uh, in her dissertation, I, I think that this sentence, and again, I'm not critiquing her or her particular argument. I'm trying to show the conceptual associations that got created as the term was extended to the Eastern African context. The Sindawe, who form the bulk of the population within this territory, are anthropologically famous for having one of the click languages found in one of the click languages found in East Africa, Greenberg 1966. So that's referring to linguistics. Even their physical appearance is different from their Bantu neighbors, being more Khoisan in character. That's from a study of the Sindawe done in 1947, uh, an anthropometric study. So looking at things like skull <laughs> shape and, and uh, hair type and skin color. Uh, these two facts, plus the long tradition of hunting and gathering, suggest that the Sindawe are remnants of a Khoisan population preceding the wave of Bantu expansion. And then she refers to Bagshawe, Newman, and Sutton. Uh, Bagshawe and Newman were looking uh, predominantly at um, ethnographic and oral historical evidence, and Sutton was using some level of archaeological evidence. So this goes back, this is just a very brief illustration of what I was talking about at the beginning of this idea of semiotic bundling. And so all of these different kinds of evidence are being, are, it's a constellation of, of historical evidence that is being seen as more or less associated with a, a single historical process. So, and what I think is really interesting about this extension of Khoisan as both a linguistic and a non-linguistic category to Eastern Africa uh, is that suspicions were arising uh, around this time that the Khoisan family had not been constructed to the same standard as other language families of Africa. And so I will reference Westfall in this case. Um, as better linguistic uh, data allowed for incre increasingly rigorous analyses between the 1970s and 2000s, results suggested that the Khoisan family could represent a typological grouping in which click continents are, are the only common feature or a hybrid genetic and typological grouping. Um, in his synthesis, Greenberg asserts that the three branches of the Southern African language complex uh, together with Hadza and Sindawe, form a tripartite family, although he does comment that Hadza is an outlier. In the decades since Greenberg's classification, the general consensus has called into the question virtually all components of his conclusion. The minority opinion, from what I can tell, it would be interesting to hear if I've read, to hear from you if you think I've read the literature correctly, the minority opinion is that Khoisan represents an entirely genetic family to which Hadza and Sindawe belong. Uh, others have concluded that Hadza is unrelated, to the other languages in the family, but that the others are in fact parts of a genetic um, grouping. The status of Sindawe is more equivocal. Numerous studies have observed similarity between Sindawe and the Southern African language complex, but it has also been considered an isolate. Uh, Sand's dissertation was the first comprehensive and systematic application of the comparative method uh, to representatives of all branches typically included in the Khoisan family. She ends with the conclusion that Sindawe is, quote, a little more likely than not to be related through common ancestry to the Southern Khoisan languages, um, rather than their similarities having arisen through chance. Uh, Goldemann and Elderkin recall that a relationship between Sindawe and Khoikhoi has been promised for over a century. While they hope that their application, the application of new techniques, uh, has made the fulfillment of that promise a little more likely than it was, evidence for such a grouping, uh, quote, can still only be categorized as promising. Even the coherence of Greenberg's subfamily 
Southern African subfamily has been questioned with an increasing number of scholars suggesting that uh, South African Khoisan consists of three independent lineages and up to two additional isolates. Uh, if the Khoisan family, as described by Greenberg, is indeed genetic and includes only languages sharing a common ancestor, then that ancestor likely existed so long ago that it is now difficult to prove through the use of the comparative method. If the Khoisan family is typological, then a number of processes, including independent innovation, divergence, convergence, and language extinction, will need to be investigated in order to explain the geographic distribution of click consonants across four to seven unrelated families. And so thinking about my point at the beginning about thinking, thinking how our categories can both um, uh, produce but also foreclose particular kinds of historical narratives. Uh, I think it would be worthwhile for linguists uh, to really, I know many of you have, but I think it would be worthwhile for you to continue thinking about um, uh, what a commitment to the Khoisan category as being genetic does in terms of how other people take up your scholarship and try to do things with it. Um, uh, and also those same questions, if you, if you say, okay, you know what, it's actually typological, let's come up with, let's break it down into what the evidence suggests are these different families and come up with different terms for each of them. Those are going to produce very different kinds of historical narratives. But that's actually gonna take a lot of work um, uh, in order to communicate the subtleties of that to archeologists, anthropologists, geneticists, historians, everybody else. Um, so I'll stop reading. Uh, and actually, before I jump to the archeology, span I think I'm also really interested in sort of the visual representations of the family. So these two charts are from a genetic study. And uh, they certainly are arguing for not only a genetic linguistic relationship, what that means to linguistics, they're also arguing for a, a genetic chromosomal relationship. And there is a way in which the way that they visually present this evidence suggests that as historical linguistic analyses sort of fade out, genetic evidence stands at the ready and we can sort of carry these lineages back in time. But I would like to suggest that you're going to get very different kinds of historical analyses if, and I realize people, not everybody agrees, and this is from uh, uh, Goldemann and, and Stone King, Stone King, I'm not sure how to pronounce the second name. Um, if, for example, this were, um, were widely adopted, that's going to, to lead, that's going to produce very different kinds of interdisciplinary collaborations than, than the previous. So, uh, Foraging at the Frontier was the name of a recent NSF application that I put in to get money for radiocarbon dating and chemical analyses of beads and obsidian. And uh, what my dissertation is trying to do, so as I mentioned, I became very interested in the prehistory of the region. And um, what I realized was people have made arguments for the history of the Sandawe homeland over the last 500 years. The reason that's useful um, is because I can then, I could use that to extrapolate expected archaeological signatures if those particular kinds of social processes were true. And then I could design fieldwork in order to generate evidence that would allow me to test whether or not those social processes actually happened. Um, and so that in a nutshell was my dissertation work and I'm still doing the analysis. So this is uh, more of a show and tell of what I did rather than, although I will get to some results at the end. And I'm going to go very quickly because I want to make sure that we have time to chat. And I think I had 40 minutes and I'm like a minute over now. So I'm going to go fast. Sorry. Um, there have actually been many models developed from different disciplines to think about forager food producer relations. Um, ethnography, uh, mainly in Central and Eastern Africa, has produced these notions of sim symbiosis and parallelism. We get ideas of frontier expansion from historical work, mainly in Western Africa, but also elsewhere around the world. Uh, through some collaborations between uh, linguistics and genetics, we get ideas of demic diffusion. Um, and then more recent work, mainly from Southern Africa, also a bit from Eastern Africa, is this idea of political economic mosaics. Um, as it turns out, the, I won't talk about this, um, or that, uh, as it turns out, uh, the ways that uh, Newman, Jim Newman, and uh, Eric Tenra uh, talked about the history of the Sindawi homeland have a lot 
um, we're, we're informed, excuse me, we're informed quite heavily by frontier theory. And to summarize very quickly, using different lines of evidence, both of them suggest that food production entered the homeland from the Northwest and moved towards the Southeast. Newman was using predominantly demographic information. So he was looking at population size in the 1960s and trying to work backwards to say how long would it have taken for the population to get this big. He argues um, that food production must, experimentation with food production must have started by the 1500s or 1600s in order for the population to get to where it was in the mid 1900s. Tenra uh, was writing a little bit earlier, but he is arguing that um, there may have been some early experimentation, but that um, for whatever reason, the Sandawi homeland managed to stay relatively isolated until the 1700s or 1800s when there was fairly intense um, contact between the Sandawe and particularly the Nyaturu to the north, to the northwest. And again, he describes it as a wave of acculturation that um, moves from the northwest to the southeast. And he actually even marks on this map, you can see this dotted line in the middle. Um, he says that the line of, of division between two cultural areas of people who identify as Sandawe but nonetheless have different linguistic and economic practices uh, that are legacies of that history of contact. Um, so some of the questions I had were, what evidence do we actually have for the onset of food production in the region? Was it early or late? Um, what evidence do we have for the onset of extra regional exchange networks? And so things that you can study to get at that are things like glass beads, obsidian, cowrie shells, those things are not available locally. So if you find them, they came from somewhere else. And what's really uh, great, you can't really do too much with cowrie shells, unfortunately, uh, for various uh, uh, reasons related to their uh, chemical makeup that I actually don't know much about. But um, what's great about glass beads and obsidian is that you can do chemical analyses of them. And um, volcanoes produce uh, different, uh, the lava, that's produced by each volcano is slightly distinct and you can actually tell which volcanoes the obsidian came from. Uh, and glass beads, uh, there are very broad geographic differences in the chemical makeup of sand that gets used in glass to make glass beads. And we also know that uh, glass beads don't appear to have been made locally. So um, as I mentioned, if they're there, they must have been brought in. And you can, um, you can combine that Ideally, you have excavated material and you can um, get good dates on that. So you can get some both spatial control and chronological control. Um, I won't talk about this, but this was an earlier attempt to take a historical model of frontier theory and come up with archaeological signatures so that you could actually identify what's going on. So what I did for my field work was I split the region into a northwest zone and a southeast zone. And I did equivalent numbers of, um, of each technique uh, in each zone, uh, which was very difficult because if you've been to this region, it's still very heavily uh, vegetated. So doing archeological survey was actually quite difficult. Uh, I have lots of fun stories about that, but I won't go into them now. Um, there were several areas that were just simply inaccessible. So some of, some of the, my ideal field methods had to be guided by just pragmatics in the end. Um, I ended up doing both surface and subsurface sampling. So that means I was trying to find artifacts on top of the ground and in the ground. And to do that, I dug 1,800 shovel test pits, which are basically just small holes at regular intervals. Uh, and you mainly do that. It's a very quick way to identify where archaeological materials are located, mainly focusing on presence absence rather than what the objects you find are. Um, it was too difficult to do survey of surface materials uh, in a truly randomized fashion, so we focused on cleared fields. Um, and then it was also too difficult to totally try to randomize a survey of the rock shelter, so that was uh, much more um, targeted and involved lots of um, work with local communities. And we found quite a lot of uh, sites this way across two field seasons. We found over 350 sites. Um, these are just some maps of where the survey was done. These are some of the shovel test pits. It gives you a sense of some of the kinds of um, images that are produced to give you senses of artifact distribution. Um, 
I can come back to these if you would like. I, to the extent that I could, I worked with Imogene Lim and tried to relocate all of the rock shelters that she had found in the 1980s. Um, this gives you a sense of, so hers were in yellow. The items in green are the rock shelters that uh, I found through um, a more extensive survey. She was really focused around the village of Farqua. Um, the red that's just come up on the screen are the open air sites that we found by um, looking on the ground in uh, fields. And then this is the site, all of these sites in relation to those shovel test pits that we, um, that we did. Uh, we also did some open air and rock shelter excavations. This is a picture from an excavation at a rock shelter called Gekuma. Um, I won't show these. There were some really interesting sites, very unexpected sites, very large, very old, probably, sites. Um, I relocated, for those of you who know the literature, I relocated a site known as Lelesu, which is considered to be an early Iron Age site in the area. Um, that site is not small. It's about 15 hectares. It's pretty big. It's one of the largest sites we found. Um, there's another site called Gubuse, which is also quite large, about seven hectares. Um, and one of the things that was very exciting about that is we found an intact iron forge. Um, here's a picture of that excavation. In the back, the sort of black dark spots are um, uh, slag heaps. And so not only did we find a large number of sites, um, it was over a very large time period. So we found sites from the Middle Stone Age up to the present. And uh, I'm focusing on sites from uh, the last 3,000 years. So I will eventually publish all of the information. But for the dissertation, I'm focusing on um, sites that we can be reasonably confident are from the last 3,000 years, and that was sort of an arbitrary cutoff based on when we expect food production to have entered the area. Here are some examples of some of the artifacts we found, um, cowrie cell beads, some of those uh, glass beads, ostrich egg cell beads, um, obsidian flakes. Uh, it was also very exciting at Lalesu. Lalesu had always presumed to have been associated with early metallurgy. Uh, and we actually, when we went back and did an intensive survey at the site, we found a small piece of metal and some slag, which is in the lower right corner of this picture. Uh, here are some other trade beads. Those red beads with the white centers are very characteristic beads from the 1800s. Um, probably well, they are actually produced in several places. Uh, these uh, were probably produced in Southern Europe, uh, but were brought in by uh, the Germans and the British. And the last couple of slides uh, before I stop, this was a really rough and dirty analysis. I'm still working through it uh, um, in more detail to make sure that, it, that it, it holds up. But one thing I did was I went through the, the ceramic sherds that I found and based using my best um, uh, ideas based off of other ceramics that have been found and dated from elsewhere in Tanzania and Eastern Africa. I assigned them into four, I assigned them to four broad categories based on their morphology and the styles that you find on the ceramics. Uh, into early Iron Age, as I will, I don't have time to talk about this, the archeological record in Northern Tanzania is a total mess. Um, Early Iron Age spans 3,000 years, um, but for, this, for these purposes, I was like, let's say zero to 1,200. Middle Iron Age, um, we don't really know what middle or Iron Age means in this part of Tanzania, um, but the evidence we have from Kondoa suggests that something happened um, between 1,200 and 1,500 in terms of um, landscape occupation. These ceramics resemble those ceramics from Kondoa. Um, I know from having done ethnographic work, the forms of ceramics that were produced in the 1900s into the present. Everything else got put into this category of the later Iron Age. So as I said, rough and dirty. Um, and then I did some spatial analysis to look at the distribution of these artifacts through time. And these are called standard deviational ellipses and, and, and centroids. Uh, centroid, um, it just, basically what this analysis does is it looks at the spatial distribution of anything in a particular feature class and it draws a circle that, or an ellipse that contains um, two-thirds of all of the examples. 
So a standard deviation. And, and it puts a, a point in the middle. So of the material that we think is the oldest, um, you can see the red dot in the center down there. It seems to be fairly restricted. Um, this, these ceramics that resemble those of Kondoa um, from this 1200 to 1500 time period uh, become more dispersed across the landscape. And the center, so meaning the, the, our, the, the point which is in the center of two thirds of all of the examples of that, of that kind moves to the Northwest. Um, this circle moves slightly, ignore that. It was a small error I made it actually, just ignore it, it's fine. Um, the pink circle kind of moves, but I can explain what happened there. Um, when you look at the later period, 1500 to 1900 is my best guess at this point. I will have a better idea once I do the radiocarbon dating. Becomes more dispersed across the landscape. Also seems to move up towards the Northwest. And then interestingly, um, the most recent material uh, becomes less dispersed across the landscape and moves back towards the Southeast. Now, pots do not e equal people. But one thing that is very interesting about this trend is that through time, one, it suggests that food production is longer established um, in the region uh, and played a larger role than suggested based off of the historical reconstructions based off of uh, linguistic and oral historical analysis. Um, two, the movement of the evidence. So this is an indirect line of evidence. I do not yet have any direct evidence of farming, but I'm for, for purposes of this, let's say that the that farmers were using pottery. The spread of that material actually happens in, a, in the completely opposite direction of what those other narratives, those other reconstructions said. What that means, I don't know yet. That's what I'll be working through. What I think is interesting about the fact that the more recent material seems to be less restricted or less distributed across the landscape is an idea that I've been playing with um, is that um, uh, this is a map that shows uh, European explore, explorers routes through the Sandawe homeland. Those routes followed existing trade routes. And so one thing that I've been toying with is that it could be that the reason you see those sites less dispersed across the landscape, that this is actually a material reflection of people becoming more incorporated with those trade routes. It could also be a reflection of um, efforts to settle people in villages um, in the 1970s as part of Ujamaa. So um, that's all very rough analysis just to give you a sense of, of some of the kinds of things that I can do with the archaeological material. Um, I'll stop there uh, for questions, but um, sort of trying to bring these two things back together, the reason I think it's important to think about the Khoisan category um, in this context is because uh, I, think, I think we need to put more attention to thinking through um, both convergences and divergences across these different lines of evidence. And doing that uh, intellectual history sort of brings to the surface the kinds of associations that have been made in, in the past allows us to reconsider whether or not we think they are valid or useful uh, for us in the present based on evidence today. And uh, can, I, I hope, can be um, a source of developing and testing new kinds of uh, models and narratives about the past. So I will leave it there. And thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. So uh, given uh, the time, uh, we would uh, originally have four minutes left to the top of the hour, but um, because there's so much here to uh, unpack and I think some really interesting uh, things that we can dive into, I'd like to uh, uh, probably extend our session by about 10 more minutes, so probably 10 minutes past. Uh, and if people, if people want to send you questions through email, I can always answer questions via email. Right, absolutely. So uh, during the live portion of the webinar, we are going to be taking uh, text questions through uh, the chat module. So those of us who, um, so those of us who want to ask uh, questions 
uh, could we please uh, write our questions in the uh, chat module? So we'll be doing text questions uh, today. Uh, so um, the first question I see is from Richard Griscom, and I will be reading them out so, uh, so people who listen to the uh, presentation later on will know what the question is. Uh, so the first uh, question from Richard is, uh, have your results led you to favor any of the previously proposed models for relationships between foragers and non-foragers with regards to the Sandawe? So, yes. Um, the way that I had been uh, approaching this analysis was I was, uh, especially for the, the National Science Foundation money that I'm using, is I'm using, uh, there are actually several different kinds of frontier models, but the one that I'm using uh, was developed by Alexander, and um, it, uh, it can be uh, called uh, food producing frontier expansion, I guess would be the simplest way to refer to it. And the idea uh, is that uh, food production uh, began in certain areas, and that as it expanded out, the people who were on sort of the the bow wave of of, of that migration um, are actually not so dissimilar from uh, the foraging communities that they move into, and that you eventually see, and that's called a um, moving frontier, and you eventually see a consolidation of um, of their uh, use of and control over the landscape, such that foraging communities either disappear, uh, are assimilated, or manage to survive in refugia uh, that are created based on geographic or climatic conditions. That was sort of one model that I was using. And then the other model, which is this idea of political economic mosaics. The problem with the political economic mosaics idea is it's actually more of a concept than a model at this point. Um, but I, I think that this idea of mosaic interactions uh, is going to uh, better help me walk through the diversity of the evidence that we're finding. Um, I really don't see um, the frontier model being supported. And one way that the ceramic data, for example, uh, would argue against a frontier model is that based on the frontier model, um, you would expect that early evidence of food producers that those sites, the model explicitly expects that um, archeological sites related to early food producers are small and um, uh, fairly localized. But what we, I actually find a complete opposite trend. So um, at this point, I don't have radiocarbon dates, so it, uh, I, can't, I can't be sure of this, but my hunch based off of um, what I know so far is that the earliest sites are actually quite large and very widely dispersed across the, the landscape. And it's actually through time that the sites seem to become um, smaller and less dispersed. So that is actually, that is uh, precisely the opposite of what the model would expect. So what that means, I don't know yet, um, but I do um, have this evidence, this one line of evidence so far that suggests that that model, um, if it's going to be used, needs some serious modification in this context. Right. Thank you, uh, Matthew. Martin has a question. Martin Mouse has a question. He asks, why are Sandawe considered traditional foragers? He uh, further sort of qualifies this by saying Alagwa, who are uh, South Cushitic speaking people, and Nyaturu, who are Bantu speaking people, entered Sandawe in relatively large quantities according to their clan division. Do you know when and how that happened and what it tells us about power and esteem relations? Or do you have anything to say about what you think? Yeah. Um... The issue of why are the Sandawe considered traditional foragers is actually really interesting, and I think it's a it's um, it's perhaps more complicated to answer than might seem readily apparent. Um, I think a lot of the, I think much of the reason why they oftentimes get talked about as foragers, there are genetic studies that just flat out, even published within the last few years, that flat out refer to the Sandawe as foragers, which is not true. 
I mean, they do hunt and gather, but they also fish. They also um, do beekeeping. They also have livestock. They also raise crops. They do a lot of things. Um, they produce salt for local for the local salt trade. Um, that all gets erased in in these genetic studies. So I think a lot of it does have to do with the with the um, uh, novelty, seeming novelty of the click consonants, um, and and so there had always been a presumption that even if they are not foraging now, they must have foraged in the past because there is such an association with click consonants and foraging from Southern Africa. Um, and then also you have the, the Hadza. And so there are ways in which the historical understanding of Southern Africa um, gets used as a model for Eastern Africa. So people are like, okay, well, whatever happened um, in Southern Africa, probably something similar happened with the Hadza and the Sandawe. But the reason it's actually really quite complicated to answer that question is because the Sandawe, I mean, the Sandawe in some situations talk about themselves and they do have oral histories of themselves as, as having been foragers. Um, but other times they, they see themselves as food producers and they have oral histories of that. Um, it is also the case that the Sandawe and the Hadza read what is written about them. And there are ways that the scholarship, I mean, people have written about this all over the world. It's, you know, I'm not saying anything new. There are ways that the scholarly understanding of the Hadza and Sandawe has actually become a part of, the, of their own understanding of themselves. Um, and so it, it, it also can become very sensitive, you know, because I don't want to come in and say, well, you're not foragers. That's really not what I'm trying to do. But it's also clear that um, there are political and economic implications of that. Uh, Tanzania has all these programs that um, are focused on um, groups that are considered to be indigenous or more traditional. And so there's also a way that this kind of research could, could impact those, their ability to access those kinds of resources. So this is actually very difficult and I think also shows the importance of, of thinking about the larger ecologies, uh, uh, the political uh, situations that, that our categories and narratives actually circulate, circulate in. Regarding the Alagua and the Yaturu, um, uh, Ten Ra, uh, has written about that fairly extensively. If you uh, would like me to send those, I can. Um, and uh, he, I think the timeline of that, it seems to have been over the last two or 300 years, uh, seems uh, fairly solid. I mean, I buy his uh, linguistic analysis. He looks at things like um, livestock terminology uh, and where different kinds of livestock terminology uh, uh, came from in Sindawe and, and how that corresponds to some oral historical accounts of when particular groups came into the area. Um, it is certainly the case that uh, Alagua um, uh, continued to be known, uh, although it's not necessarily practiced as often. Um, many Sindawe are practicing Muslims and Catholics and especially among the Catholics, uh, there's, uh, there's hesitancy to participate in, and if you do participate in, talk about having participated in things like rainmaking rituals. The Alagua are certainly associated with that. Um, I also think that our idea of the Sandawe needs to be revised. Ten Ra um, very clearly demonstrates that there are these different dialectical groups, different cultural groups. Um, and also when you think about the Nyaturu, uh, there are particular clans of the Nyaturu that um, Chueso is one of them, that the way that they talk about themselves, um, it can really, you can sort of see elements of ethnogenesis in it. And there's sort of a tendency to say, well, you're either Nyaturu or you're Sandawe, but um, I think it can be really useful to think about, well, maybe they're not really either. Um, I don't know if that really answered your question, but those are some of my initial responses. Thanks, Matthew. Bonnie Sands uh, asks a follow-up question to sort of what you were just talking about. She said she wants to hear more about the salt trade. Do you have anything oh. to talk about in terms of the salt trade? that this involved? So I want to dig into the salt trade a lot more. Um, the reason, and I would love to talk to you about it if you would like, if you would like to carry this on uh, later. Uh, I first got interested in the salt trade when I was doing the leafy vegetable project, because one of the things that I did as part of that project was to talk to people about the different kinds of preparations. And one thing that became 
apparent is that if you're cooking the vegetables such that they turn out like sauteed greens, um, there are salts you want to put salt in. Uh, but if you're making omelenda, you actually use soda. And the an omelenda is a gelatinous, you boil it and stir it and it all breaks down and becomes this gelatinous substance that helps the ugali go down. And um, the soda apparently helps to break down the cell walls so that you get the nice texture. And so as part of that project, I uh, started visiting all of the local salt production sites. And there's some absolutely enormous salt production sites. Um, and so I was talking to the mainly women who are producing that salt, um, talking about how they provide it to the Amnada networks. Uh, there is some hesitancy to talk about it because you can be fined for selling salt that's not iodized, but people, most people don't want to use iodized salt um, all of the time for various reasons. Uh, and um, one of the really frustrating things to me is that I explicitly did survey, archaeological survey, around the two largest salt production sites and I cannot find any archeological remains. So um, in terms of timeline, that's very frustrating. The reason salt production is uh, a topic of interest to archeologists who are studying early food production is um, because uh, early pastoralists will oftentimes need access to salt uh, for their livestock. And so then this becomes very interesting. And also um, uh, farmers will need salt too, uh, depending on what their dietary base is. So this is all very intriguing and evocative and I'm very excited to try to do something with it. Um, so I know where a lot of the salt production sites are. I have a feeling that at least two of them are really quite uh, long running. There's one near Senzawa that is absolutely enormous. They've, it's uh, dug into a stream bed and the area that has been actively mined for salt is a couple hundred meters long, maybe 40 meters wide, and anywhere from three to eight meters deep. I mean, it's huge. And so I think they've been doing it there for a long time. I cannot find archaeological material to try to get a sense of the time depth. So, so I'm super excited about it. And because we do know that there are these other, there have been some other archaeological surveys of salt production, um, usually in the context of the caravan trade. So I don't know that's going to get into the dissertation, but that is definitely something I want to pick up later just because I found it all to be so fascinating. Well, this is an interesting sort of point to jump on. Bonnie has another sort of follow-up question. She asks, could access to salt have been more important in allowing the Hadza and Sandawe to resist assimilation than other factors that have been identified? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. One of the... Um, um, this is one of the problems with, so one of my problems with this idea of mosaics is that it is so capacious that it risks actually flattening diversity just like uh, some of the other models can do. So if everything is a mosaic, nothing is a mosaic. Um, but one of the things that I think is quite interesting from people who have been, uh, who have been informed by that idea, um, two people come to mind. So Stephanie Wynne-Jones, in terms of her thinking about uh, the caravan trade, also um, uh, Chap Kusimba in, in Kenya, who's also worked with the caravan trade, and then Kate DeLuna, who's done some historical linguistic work in um, uh, Zambia. One of the things that they, uh, one of the ideas that they raise is that uh, one of the drivers of interaction and exchange uh, would have been the distribution of patchy resources across the landscape. And that that, um, that could have represented in some instances early forms of specialization that would um, have revolved around something like uh, technology rather than linguistics or ethnic identity. And I find that idea really fascinating. Um, so yes, I would like to keep exploring that. Thank you for, thank you for those questions. And as I mentioned, I'd, I'd love to keep chatting with you about this because I, in my uh, free time, I have been uh, sort of reading about examples of salt trade from elsewhere in Sub-Saharan Africa and it's sort of always in the back of my mind, but I don't know what to do just yet with, with the material I have now from, from this region. Interesting. Uh, 
Bonnie has a little contribution. Uh, Bonnie Sands has a little contribution. She says, as someone who was part of this history of reclassification of the Hadza, for example, she says, I can say that it was a challenge to counter the Greenberg classification. She was urged to consider a different topic for my dissertation, to focus on positive results rather than a negative result. And this is a general problem of replication in the sciences. People really seemed uh, to need a simple scenario to deal with the plethora of African languages at the time, uh, not um, a more complex one. She mm -hmm. also in Packendorf et al. 2017, they found that the frontier model didn't work well for Bantu Khoisan interactions in Southern Africa. And she finishes with a question. She says, do you have evidence of Iron Age refugees entering Usandawe? And she's thinking of people working as porters on the slave routes, people escaping the slave trade, and also people escaping famine. Uh, we talk about this sort of very chaotic period uh, just before the arrival of the Germans, for example, and, mm -hmm. and directly after. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so first of all, thank you for the Packendorf article. I had not come across that, so I'll make sure to check that out. There, so um, one thing that I will be doing between now, I'm still sort of in the depths of working through the um, artifact analysis, but at one, uh, before I finish the dissertation, I'm wanting to revisit some of the ethnographic and oral historical accounts. There are accounts of people um, uh, uh, escaping in due to uh, the slave trade and, and also famine. So uh, the Alagua would be an example of that. Uh, fairly well, I think, established uh, oral historical and historical linguistic uh, accounts of that process. Um, one of the things that I've thought about is there are a lot of oral histories of the Sandawe um, both contributing to, but also fleeing from the effects of the caravan trade. And one thing that I have thought about is, is it possible that, um, so people have oftentimes, it is still true that a lot of Sandawe prefer to live fairly far away from their neighbors. And sometimes people read that as, oh, well, that's because they're hunter-gatherers and hunter-gatherers need, uh, need to be distributed across the landscape. It could actually also be a reflection that could have been a, a political strategy in the response to uh, the formation of more exploitative trade relations. Uh, the Sadawi certainly have, have stories of, of having fled into the bush to escape conscription into uh, uh, labor for the railroad. Uh, so maybe that's actually a longer form. And we've actually, because we've been so committed to this idea of of them being Khoisan and of them being foragers, that we sort of read it as evidence of this foraging tradition, but it's actually evidence of their incorporation into this um, political and economic milieu over the last couple of hundred couple of hundred years. Um, one of the well, I won't show the map, but another reason why I do think uh, the these categories, thinking about the histories of these categories, are very important. We really don't have a, a good understanding of, of the spread of metallurgy and farming across Tanzania. We just don't. Um, the dates make no sense. They, they span 3,000 years. They span a wider time period than anywhere else in Eastern or Central Africa. Um, there was an archaeological project in the 60s and 70s to obtain archaeological evidence of the Bantu expansion, which was derived from linguistic analysis. So when linguistic analysis seemed to suggest that there was this rapid expansion of, of Bantu speakers across Sub-Saharan Africa, um, archaeology wanted to see what they could do to contribute. However, um, due to uh, logistics, financial and otherwise, uh, and also the area under discussion, they purposefully went as far apart across the map as they could. So they were not doing an intensive survey, they were doing a very extensive survey. So you have these very widely dispersed single sites. So you'll have one site in the middle of some region of Tanzania that's hundreds of kilometers away from the next closest site. And these um, single sites with single kind of suspect dates. And 
some people have read that as, well, you see, that's actually a, a good evidence of this rapid expansion of Bantu speakers across Tanzania. Archaeologically, that's not. We actually don't, that's not good evidence. Um, uh, because we don't even have direct evidence of farming. In most cases, we don't even have direct evidence of metallurgy. We just have the ceramics. And so you actually do need to do these smaller scale, finer grained archaeological studies to get a better sense of the chronology, to get a better sense of what was actually happening. Then you can zoom out and have this conversation about, about migration. Um, so that's sort of Tanzania more broadly. But I'd say the same applies. I mean, I'm running into those same challenges in, in terms of thinking through the evidence from, from northern Tanzania. Very interesting. That's uh, some tantalizing, um, some tantalizing kind of uh, details, I think. Um, and uh, I, I'd like to actually continue the conversation, but I think, Matthew, we're just going to have you have to have you back sometime. <laughs> okay, I'd be happy to come back. Um, and, uh, but I, I think here at this point, I'd like to end by thanking Matthew and reminding listeners that all talks that are part of our Rift Valley Network webinar series can be found on our YouTube page and are added to the Rift Valley Network bibliography. Uh, looking ahead, the next presentation in the webinar series will take place on August 26th, where Jeremy Coburn will present some exciting new data on the sounds of Hadza in a talk titled Hadza Phonetics 3D, 4D Ultrasound and Other Instrumental Analyses. Uh, also, uh, we will be having a Rift Valley Network Standing Committee meeting tomorrow. It's our programs committee, and uh, that will be... Uh, Yes, that will be um, uh, via Zoom once again. Uh, so uh, thank you everybody for attending this uh, bumper of a presentation and uh, uh, we're looking forward to seeing you and hearing from you uh, again. Thank you very much.